Welcome to our session on technology in a fractured world. Uh, we're talking about social fracture and technology as a, a cause uh, and potentially a cure for that. Uh, we're talking about Uh, somewhat the cause of that. Um, social media has been accused of amplifying outright outrage and extremity of opinion, uh, math washing, um, amplifying our biases uh, in a hidden form inside algorithms is blamed for um, missed opportunity to address issues of inequality. Um, we have accusations that um, uh, evil enterprises are exploiting our assumed rights to our own data. Um, some of which is probably true to some level. And whether it's true or not, we have increasing levels of mistrust in technology. Um, so we'll be discussing, is, is that true? What's important? And also, um, it's not uncommon for technology to initially create hope and opportunity, but also to create side effects. And then, of course, we need new technologies and regulatory solutions to those side effects. So it's part of progress that we have some problems along with the benefits. But the question is, can technology also be a part of the solution? So we've got a wonderful panel to discuss that today, a mixture of investors and technologists um, and commentators and bystanders like myself. Um, and let me just briefly introduce the panel. Uh, so we have uh, Agnes Budzin, who is a co-founder and managing partner at SFI Growth Fund, which is an investor in tech. Uh, we hopefully at some point will have uh, Hao Yuan Li, um, who is the CEO of Aluxio, which is a an open source data orchestration company. He'll explain to us what that, what that means. And a professor at Beijing University. We have Kirk Bresnica, who is the chief architect, um, an interesting title at Hewlett Packard Labs, responsible for machine research and advanced development. Um, he's written about um, all sorts of aspects of sustainable computing, distributed uh, computing, and so on. Uh, we have uh, Lu Zhang, uh, who is the founder and managing partner of Fusion Fund, uh, another investor of VC fund investing industrial enterprise and healthcare tech. And we have Mihela Ulieru, who is president of the Impact Institute for the Digital Economy, who thinks about things like uh, what would it take for tech to be a force of good? Um, how do we uh, use distributed computing solutions like blockchain to ensure uh, a focus on human need and, and human uh, equity? Um, so let's jump in, and I've got an umbrella question uh, for, for, for each panelist, um, which is basically, um, what is your take on the some of the main problems created by uh, technology uh, in society, and some of the ways uh, in which we might, uh, some of the key dimensions of, that we might use to solve those problems, and we're going to dig into those later in the discussion. But Agnes, perhaps could we, could we start with uh, with, with you? What's the What's the problem? What's the solution with respect to technology and social fracture? I think the I think the as you said at the beginning, like technology uh, can create hope. Technology can help. Technology can uh, be you know the tipping point for a change, which is absolutely fascinating. That's why we're all in it because that's how we look at technology. But I think at some, as we're seeing from you know looking at the politics and the social media and algorithm things like that. I think there are some areas of um, the big issues are that I don't know. I don't think I have a solution. I don't think a lot of people will have either is data and ownership of a data. Data actually, uh, the data is becoming actually almost became an a, asset class. And that's something that is very, very valuable. Imagine if you have two or three companies that pretty much own the entire asset class. That's a huge, uh, you know, power shift and change. And the producers of that asset class are individuals, are us. And we are not benefiting in any way. Actually, sometimes we get hurt, sometimes purposely, sometimes by accident. And uh, very often, you know, everybody kind of uh, looks at these uh, gi giants that have this data and say, hey, something has to be done. But then the question is, who's going to do what? What are the regulations and policies that have to be in place, who is going to watch it, who is going to implement it, and how it's going to be done in a way that is fair, that is not, you know, when governments change, some of the governments may do it right, some of them may not. But from my perspective, uh, I'm looking in the, in the way of 
this is an asset class and it has to be regulated in some way that individuals who are creating it are able to benefit this. Right now we see it, NFTs in blockchain is a, is a kind of a apparently huge distributor of that. But as you kind of dig deeper, I'm not sure if that's the best way to go. But um, <laughs> I'm a big fan personally. However, you know, there's a lot of place to grow and improve and make sure again, whoever creates the NFTs, it's really the owner of the data. And you can see some of this disputes on. And please, everybody jump in as I'm, as I'm kind of speaking, because I think it's a very hot topic and very important. Right. So, so you, your thesis is that uh, data rights um, is is one of the biggest problems we face, at least. And that, uh, if I heard you correctly, you're saying that um, you would bet your money on regulation rather than technology being uh, the, the 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 solution to that. Could you say a little more about the regulation aspect? What what sort of regulation do we have a precedent for? How to regulate this this very complex problem? Because, of course. We don't necessarily know at the time when we give rights to data what the data will be used for. And there's so much data and it's used in an aggregated form that we can't necessarily trace back, you know, who owned it. So it's not a it's not it's not like a piece of land where we can say it's it's yours, here's the title. And and, and it can be used in, in predictable ways. What are there any precedents there? So I think in a perfect world, which doesn't exist, but in a perfect world, each of us would have this kind of a data avatar only, almost, where I am born, I'm born with, you know, with certain IDs, with my healthcare records, with, you know, what I write on Twitter or Facebook or any other medias, that should be all tagged to me as an individual. So then where there are disputes of who is, let's say, using pictures of, of me when I was a child, or, you know, or me who has a, I don't know, medical history or something kind of you know personal record or where I shop because Amazon has more, more all my data of how I shop what I buy what time all these things like it should be me Amazon or Google or Facebook or anybody else should not be able to take that data bundle it up and sell it to some kind of third provider and get paid for it mm-hmm. I should be getting paid for that so I don't know exactly how you know the regulation needs to be set but there are a few ways you know one you can make the data just open source and uh, and that's the, that's the one way of really companies will be looking at it that they cannot really benefit it without your permission, or you know the futuristic idea is to have a, some kind of form of avatar that can have as much data as you can attach to yourself or tag to yourself. It's not going to be everything because it's impossible. I think there, we produce so much data that it's literally impossible, but there has to be a, some kind of beginning because it has to, again, it has to come down to the individual. And I'm not even like a, you know, creator who goes and, you know, writes articles, many articles, or, you know, uh, posts any kind of uh, pictures or any art or, or any things like that. But there are multiple people who are, you know, inv- innovative and creative that way. And again, it should be all, uh, you know, tagged to them. Right, and it, yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's, 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 that's a great opener for us. Yeah. Um, Dirk, I'm, I'm imagining you might have a slightly different view about what the, the key challenges are in terms of technology and social fracture and what some of the solutions might be. What would your uh, top, top one or two problems and solutions be? Well, I actually don't know if I – I think I, in large part, agree with, with Agnes. Uh, I think actually where we would see uh, potential isn't just in regulation, but what are those technologies? And the, the problem with regulations is at some point I have to trust that someone's obeying the rules. And I don't want to have to trust. I'd rather have it be provable. So what are those technologies that we can implement so that, as Agnes described, my personal data corpus that I aggregate through my life, will I be equitably able to transact with not just one or two mega companies, but all of us, you know, all eight billion of us, all of us interacting with a hundred billion smart things? Um, we actually, you know, can see line of sight to be able to to take those um, those interactions and allow the individual to solve over the data. And I guess the biggest thing for me comes to can we create distributed systems of equity? Because yeah, right now, and th- you can look at technology. You know, back when we invented telephones, there was one phone company, and that was a dominant position. There was one where, when we start with new technologies, there's usually a center of mass, and that's not the vision. That's the one who had that great vision. 
but eventually you figure out how to create an equitable distributed environment. I think we're sort of on the on the edge of those technologies now. Right. Now, for me, it also means doing things that go back down to the silicon, because the silicon, the quantum quantum uh, effects there, that could be the root, the, rooted in the the silicon, the source of provenance and not trust, but provability. Those mathematical functions we can use to say, okay, I understand what's happened to my data. I can. I can describe via my avatar what I want to have that is always acting on my behalf. All of our lifetimes worth of tiny, tiny nano transactions, and I think we actually can do these technologies, and also, most importantly, in a way that it's sustainable. Because if something's not sustainable, then there's a tiny fraction of the world's population who can afford to have their data protected. We want everyone, everyone, to have their data protected. And I do think that there are technology answers. So that's very interesting. You're saying that the, 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 the dichotomy between a regulatory solution and a technological solution might be a little artificial because even the regulatory solutions may require technological solutions. So I have yeah. two follow-up questions for you. One of them is um, the mathematical feasibility. Um, it's, it's, there's a sort of an, an East Germany sort of problem, isn't there, which mm -hmm. is if, if every piece of data usage has to be associated with a piece of data tracking and you have – an infinite number of recombinatorial possibilities. Is is it actually possible to mathematically possible to, um, to 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 solve this problem perfectly? So what's you know what what is the realm of the good enough solutions? And then you also mentioned a shift of power. So to get to your distributed solution, um, you know a lot of a lot of power has to pass from few hands to many hands. And I I wonder uh, about the feasibility of those two uh, the, those two dimensions. So I'll answer the, the second one first. And for me, uh, a distributed system is actually more sustainable, more equitable. Uh, it's more complex, guaranteed. Uh, but I actually think if you take all those things together, it's actually the potential for it to be more just. So I actually think that, especially as, as, as Agnes said, the amount of data we create, we double the amount of recorded data every other year. More, We create as much new data every two years as mankind has ever recorded. The whole idea of a data your human data center where all this is uh, being cross-correlated, you know, that will soon be completely outstripped by our ability to create data. So we have to, by necessity, if we want to admit that data for economic activity, it has to be housed in a distributed way. And as long as we're doing it in a distributed way, why don't we also do it in a in a, that creates this digital provenance back down to the silicon? So it is a case that we can create distributed systems where we retain sovereignty over the information and you know byproduct a pleasant byproduct it will be more likely that we'll be able to admit more of that data into activity into plan into transparency than we have right now with it just gets onto to uh, behind the, the click of an end user license agreement. And you have no idea what's been collected. And, and even though there's some re regulatory frameworks that say, oh, you can go and you can have them give you the data. That's the problem. As soon as the data is copied, as soon as it goes out that black wire, um, you have no idea who's copied it, who snooped it. You know, that's where retaining the data at the edge in full fidelity and full sovereignty could be the way that we answer the question of right. how do I maintain this over a long period of time. Thank you. Um, so let's move on to Lou. Um, Lou, as an investor, um, you know, every problem is also an opportunity. Um, do, do, what do you see as the problems and, and the solutions to the problems and are in fact the opportunities, the investment, uh, the investment opportunities? Yeah, I think the biggest problem, as other panelists already mentioned, that we are in an explosion of the data generated by individual, by institution, by every company. It's the asset, but uh, how to really better collecting the data, transfer the data, analysis the data, and then provide more personalized uh, result. That's the service part. Uh, meanwhile, another thing is for industry in general, how to better improve the industry efficiency. Now we're going through the cycle of economic cycle. The only technology innovation ever in the history could conquer this uh, economic cycle to improve the efficiency uh, fundamentally. So I think this is the biggest problem. If we dive into specific like healthcare, because I've been spending years in healthcare and the pandemic really raised the general attention to the healthcare sector. It's the 20% of US GDP. I call it AAA problem. It means accessibility, affordable, and accuracy. 
which all relate to the uh, no matter technology or data problem I have mentioned earlier. So this is definitely the big problem. But meanwhile, the trend we're seeing uh, happening is the digital transformation everywhere. And digital transformation in the tech industry, non-tech sector, healthcare, and the industry automation, everything. So, so the opportunity for us is really trying to identify the much better technology, better, faster, cheaper technology to integrate with tech and non-tech sector to power the digital transformation. I know sometimes when we talk about new technology trend, there's always a super sexy and dangerous term in Silicon Valley called it disruption. <laughs> disruption was so popular in the next last technology trend of the internet. But for this digital transformation, the most important part is really how to use technology as a, uh, to empower the existing player, to augment the existing procedure, and also to improve the existing uh, process for the uh, better uh, efficiency improvement. And meanwhile, another thing different from the last round of innovation is, you know, because we're talking about the digital transformation, the data, as all these panelists mentioned, data is an asset. So how to control the entrance of the data is critical. And most of the time, the entrance of the data is hardware layer. It's not the old type of the definition of the hardware, like a semiconductor or clean tech. It's a low cost sensor, which become like wide spelled integrating into all different industries since 2015. That's a new opportunity. That's also the reason why as individual, as a company, we generate so many data since probably 100 years ago, but only till now we're able to collect. So that's kind of the uh, opportunity we're seeing and we're trying to invest. I definitely see much more kind of interesting technology coming up. So another topic I really want to bring up is uh, what's, this our education, what's our attitude in general towards the technology? Uh, I know people are worried about, okay, AI going to compete with us with a job, and every time there's a new technology coming up, there's a big group of people lose their job, which is reality. But if we really look back into the history, every time, yes, new technology application makes certain group of people lose their job, but eventually it creates much more jobs. If this time we really are at a singularity point that technology is so amazing, free human capacity in certain way that we, we don't have job anymore, which means our next step is Star Trek. We're going to free ourselves to do more exploration as a human race. So I think that's really the attitude I want to promote in terms of uh, how we want to embrace the technology. Technology is neutral, as we discussed, you know, regulation is important. We want to use technology as a neutral tool to solve our problem, but we have to have the right mindset people put together regulation to solve potential, you know, data monopoly issue, to solve potential, you know, all this uh, technology integration issue, etc. But eventually, you know, as a human, as each, each like a sector, I think we all need to integrate with the tech. Probably in the near future, no matter we talk about it's a company in the hotel industry or in the tech industry, all the leaders in each sector, they have to have the tech component, even including the fashion business. They need to have the tech component in order to maintain their leadership position. So on the other way, I think we really need to think for the general population is we also need to have this general AI education. It's not like only AI person or tech person need to know about AI. Everyone needs to understand the, the, how we integrate with technology, have a general basic knowledge of AI, and then we could take it from there, have a much accelerated process of technology integration. So that, uh, thank you very much for that, Lou. I think that brings us nicely on to Mihalas, who spends a lot of time thinking about the potential for technology to become a force for good. So I think it's, it, it's a fairly well-precedented historical phenomenon that a new industry initially is treated as some sort of uh, utopian answer to all of our problems and and then reality sets in and we start to see the side effects and we start to see trust issues and regulatory issues and, and tech seems to be at that sort of turning point um this this, this word tech lash um so um it, i'm interested in 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 your view on were technology ceos to to turn around that trust dynamic and actually seem you know relevant to our common problems um primarily uh, oriented towards, you know, the human flourishing, bettering the human condition. Um, mm -hmm. What would have changed? What's the, uh, what's, the, what's the bottleneck there? How do you take something which is increasingly an object of suspicion and, and, and seen as a source of many of our problems and turn it into something that looks more like a solution to all of our problems? Well, yes, and, and with this also, I will have to say that it would be really so nice if technology would be neutral. But 
It is not. Unfortunately, it is not. And, and so I will posit this. The topic of our session is technology for a fractured world. So we have to look first at the world and see what is fractured there and how technology can hopefully mend or, you know, undo, exactly as you were saying, Dean. So what is fractured is the trust indeed. The trust, not necessarily only in technology, but the trust in our institutions and in the business ethics, which actually, you know, is spilled out all and spilled over us by the platform cartels. This is what I, what I have to underline here. So technology has been developed, you know, Historically, obviously, as we, we, we grew up in the internet era with all those hopes for, you know, all what the internet dream was for us. Mm -hmm. Access, inclusiveness, connectedness, togetherness, empowerment. And where did we end up? Well, we ended up disempowered and exactly in the st state in which my colleagues have presented the situation. The question is, why did we, did we let ourselves in this state of sleepwalking? I mean, we forgot, you know, to take accountability. It's not about technology being, being neutral only, but it is also about us taking accountability and also as designers and as technologists to develop technologies which are rather empowering than disempowering. And with this, you know, the wisdom of Mitch Kapoor which says architecture is politics. This is such a deep, has such a deep meaning because the centralized architectures is that what enabled the platform cartels to, uh, let's call it, you know, lead us to the road to unfreedom, like, like sleepwalkers, as uh, Timothy Schneider said in his book called Sleepwalkers, into a world, uh, which from freedom, we ended up with radicalization, conspiracies and, and fake news, privacy violations, data piracy, the platforming of contrarians, and so on and so forth. So it's so disempowering, this universe in which we ended up. I'm not surprised that uh, uh, the world is being even more fraptured. So right um, sorry, sorry to restrict me, you know, I think we're hearing a number of hypotheses about the you know, what the bottleneck is. I'm not sure there are, we're talking about a whole collection of challenges here and a whole collection of solutions. But, you know, if you're a CEO, you have to say that, you know, this is the critical one. This is, this is the bottleneck to increase trust. And, um, you know, I, th I think we're hearing um, the hypothesis that it's a technical problem, which is, you know, we, we have new solutions. They have technical side effects. We need to deal with the technical problems. So, you know, we could, we could bet on that one. Um, you know, that, you know, that you you have voiced, if I, if I hear correctly, the fact that you know the problem is not so much the technology; it's the monopolization of the technology, it's the concentration of power, and this is the one of the rate limiting steps. Um, I think I heard um, uh, Agnes hint that um, you know focus on relevant problems. You know, are we focused mainly on things that are peripheral to our collective needs, or are we focused on our key areas of, of need and collective challenge, the, the, you know, the object of the technological innovation. And maybe there are other hypotheses, but um, maybe you could kick us off in terms of saying, where would you, if you were advising a CEO, look, this is how to turn this around, how would you, how would you place your bets? Agnes or me? Sorry. You, sorry, that was <laughs> yes. <me. laughs> yes, and and from a technology perspective, we have solutions, and we call that reg tech. So mm. we have solutions with, as Agnes was also mentioning, and Kirk, with blockchain, artificial intelligence together. It, with all this convergence of technologies, in which we can have now the rules of the game. Uh, validated and also tracked and so we can verify everything we can actually have a trust in our internet so this is also so this this is how technology can actually improve us as human beings because human nature has proven you know unleashed on all these social networks so is that a, is that a, is that a done deal then will we solve our problems or is does it require the redirection of resources to realize them or does it require the manipulation of incentives so that we have an incentive to realize them is so i think you said yeah. the technology is not the bottleneck um is it just a matter of time before we solve these issues of 
of, 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 of privacy and concentration of power? Or what, 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 are the, what are the interventions that are necessary to put us back on the right track? It would be really great to be so easy, of course, because, I mean, if the incumbent would just, you know, <laughs> go away and let us unleash the social networks on blockchain with everything verified and which empower the individual. So it, it has to be a sustained and, and uh, coordinated effort from the forces for good to actually unleash such technologies. As I mentioned, red tech um, and and uh, and. Uh, verifiability and so on and so forth. Of course, incentives from the government, uh, we do not know, at least from my perspective. It's not what is not easy is that, of course, the incumbents are not going to give up power so easily. And this is not only about uh, technology companies, but also the government and other uh, mm -hmm. stakeholders. So I think that is the biggest resistance. Mm -hmm. No, the yes. technology is the technology is there and, and because the, the, the financial think? gains. I'm sorry, the financial gains and losses have to be aligned correctly. That's one, yeah. and I think that's going to be the biggest change. And also, I think uh, holding companies or governments responsible for things that are mm -hmm. happening that's going to be also another turning point. Because as as you know, Kirk said, you know, there is a fantastic technology that can be used that you know you can use you know you can use a distrustless machine you know um, uh, that can run certain things but again it takes uh, time and and efforts to convince certain people to to do this and that's a that's a huge you know it's a huge undertaking however if you meanwhile if we can work with what we have however start holding parties responsible what's happening uh, for what's happening for data breaches like look at the data breaches like the, the penalties and the fees for data breaches are a joke it's it's absolutely a joke. Uh, imagine, uh, like I was laughing because there was a few years ago, I think Target had a data breach and the big penalty was like $5 million. Mm -hmm. Like we're talking about huge conglomerates that are pretty much not updating their infrastructure and their technology to keep our data protected. And that's why there's so easy to hack into it. Hello, there was a hack into mm -hmm. US government. It should not be happening. And mm -hmm. if it does, you know, Capital One or Target or Walmart. The data it should hurt your bottom line. I wonder if we, we have the regulatory apparatus to be able to do that, though, because, I mean, I, I'm originally a bio biologist, and you have, you know, activators and inhibitors, and unless they they both work with roughly similar specificity and with roughly similar time constants, you basically have imbalance. The system goes out of control. And, you know, I'm not sure there is. Is there a regulation that you could put in the hands of today's regulatory system that would um, address the the speed of innovation and the speed of, the, of, of, of new problems? Or do we actually have to uh, empower government with equal power technical solutions and capabilities so that we have a balanced activator inhibitor loop. Uh, Kirk, it looks like you have an opinion on that. Uh, and this is part of the discussion I've been, I'm in right now, uh, which is how do we have agile governance that can keep up? Uh, and part of it, I think, is, um, is the, the answer might be in the question uh, in that we have, uh, you know, the, the same software technologies that landed the man on the moon uh, those are not the technology we're using right now of uh, the development methodologies. So we had to invent agile development methodologies to handle the complexity to create uh, the kind of modern software infra global infrastructure we have. We want to understand, are there more than just borrowing the agile word? Can we borrow from the methodologies and say this is also how we co-create regulation and technology so one is not an inhibitor and uh, an activator but they one becomes a scaffold that they can healthily build on and i think that's that's sort of where we are right now because unfortunately i think agnes is spot on here you know you won't see you see regulation as as the accrual of remorse and remediation um when something bad happens you know then you'll have then we regulate it. It's it's all it's all post hoc, uh, and yeah. unfortunately, I think what it means is that until a, a Fortune 500 fails overnight because of a of a of a action, or be, when there's a mass casualty event.
that's when we will sober up and decide to take the pill of all the costs associated for moving to a, a zero trust environment, to a decentralized environment that is more robust, more secure, more costly and more complex. But in the end, if it's more sustainable and more equitable, then it's we're at, we're at one of those inertia problems where we, we, we know we probably should change. We don't know how to get over that activation energy. Uh, and I would I would prefer that it doesn't happen as a result of, of a, a really horrible event. But sometimes that seems the way that, that we sort of break that stiction. So let's um, let's assuming that you you had the perfect solution. Uh, Kirk. Let's, let's supposing that you're right. The solution is distributed computing, distributed data ownership, um, uh, agile governance. Um, supposing we had it all, um, you still have a big change management problem, right? Which is how do you get from A to B? How do you get from concentrated, centralized, unregulated to, to that new state? Um, you know, I think, I think you know, my reading of, 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 of history is that we, we can get there. We can put a man on the moon. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, we tend not to do it preemptively. We tend to do it when something has caught fire or when we're threatened by, the, uh, by another nation or, um, or when something fails. Um, um, we, we can sometimes do it through heroic acts of leadership. Um, I, th I think putting a man on the moon is a, is a great example. It was, it was unreasonable. It happened in an unreasonably short amount of time, <laughs> and somehow we got the chemistry right on that occasion. How, how, what, what, where would you place your bets in terms of how we're going to get to the future? What's the most likely path? Is it heroic acts of leadership, heroic acts of regulation, um, something burning so badly, the Internet collapsing, and, uh, collapsing us and teaching us that we have a new dependence here we need to take, take care of? How do we get to the future? To me? Uh, that, was, that was a follow-up to Kirk, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, well, I think we actually are we are on a burning platform, and that's, that is, uh, you know, climate change. So there's certainly that one already um, that is staring us in the face. Uh, although I, I, I also want to I, – I like having – a, a, a long-term goal, but then, you know, can we point to some short-term successes? I think mm -hmm. it's interesting for me to imagine, you know, to see some of the, the developing and emerging economies. And um, and right now, I think the, the thing that fascinates me the most is, is can we, can I, as a technologist, can I bring the opportunity and the technologies to them without colonizing them? Can I enable them to natively express their culture and individuality, a diverse world that communicates is a stronger world. A fractured world that is at odds is, is a dangerous world. So can we actually go and, and is there opportunity in emerging economies to embrace and drive the technology as the as the the model for this kind of success you're talking about? So rather than dealing with all of our baggage, uh, and and saying is is this a, is that an opportunity for us? Can we can we look from north to south, or however you want to you know divide the world up and say is there an opportunity for us to engage in a conversation? And it's not an easy one, uh, but it it could be a very fruitful one to understand how we bring that kind of strength through diversity and that a chance to start. Can we start where we have an emerging economy where there's little there there's less baggage, there's less incumbency. And not just, you know, drop in today's mega corporation solution to everything, which just makes everything look bland and vanilla anyways. Um, but is that is that the opportunity that we should be seeking out as technologists to, to contribute into that forming, to that conversation, uh, rather than impose a, a solution as clever as we are um, that just ends up sounding like an echo of us when we really want to have that, that different voice? Thank you, Kirk. Lou, would you agree with that, or do you see a different path to the future? Uh, I would say partially agree with that. Uh, regulation always comes at last, uh, because we won't expect uh, the government to be the most efficient institute in the world, which they are not. They will never be. So so we have to just uh, try our best to facilitate them, to engage them, not to block the innovation, not to drive the regulation to the wrong way. Um, I was in a uh, webinar with, you know, HBI, this uh, institute at Stanford. They try to facilitate uh, this decision maker from different industry. They recently published the AI index report. So all of this effort, I think, is uh, done by the tech industry in general to educate the decision maker, the re regulator. Understand, you know, don't be too confident about technology. Meanwhile, understand the, the progressing updates of the technology and then uh, make the right decision 
in the certain point that may be a little bit aggressive, but not necessarily block the way, especially for smaller startups. I think another potential opportunity and potential push is now for this digital transformation trend for this AI application. It's now the US innovation. It's a global innovation. So it's a global competition as well. So when we talk about regulation, one part of it is really define the ownership of the data, the ownership of this new type of asset. No matter how rich an individual is, I think in the future for every single of us, our auto institute, our company, digital asset, data asset, going to be the richest and also the most fast growing asset we're going to have. So how government really want to define ownership and also governance of the data, that's the kind of the strong push and the strong motivation for them to protect their own interest. So I think that would be a very interesting angle for us to leverage to really make them think about the right way to do the regulation. So um, we probably have time for one, one more round, and I wonder whether we could play a little game. Um, so in the uh, uh, mid-1940s, the, there was the UN Declaration of, uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was a sort of a manifesto for, uh, that changed the game in terms of uh, you know, what, what should human beings expect in terms of their rights and their responsibilities. And then um, some years later, we had the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, which was um, a series of quantitative metrics to mobilize against planetary challenges. Supposing that the moonshot here is to, to put technology on the right track, to restore trust in technology, to deal with the side effects of technology, to, um, to maximize the opportunity for, for, for technology to be a force for good. And supposing we were defining a manifesto, uh, you know, 10 statements or principles that uh, tech leaders could, uh, could adopt to put things on the right track. Um, maybe, maybe we can each volunteer a couple of principles on what would be in that manifesto, what would be on the list? What would you say, Kurt? Uh, I will start with sustainable. Uh, because for me, sustainability is the key to equity. We can, can we afford to provide this technology to everyone? If it's not sustainable, then the answer is going to be no. Okay. Scalability, I think, as well. Because as, as you know, it's very similar to, to what Kirk was saying. If you cannot scale it to everyone at the very, very cheap cost, with um, also with a very limited education of our, each person, because we're all, you know, there are different levels of education. So that's another thing. Some rich nations can afford a, anything and everything, and there are some nations that simply cannot, and we cannot exploit them, and we cannot let, let them leave them behind, because they are part of the global village. We want it or we don't. That's, we should include everyone. And we should also do it in the way that they are benefiting from it. Because imagine this, if I have a, if there is a, I don't know, Mark doing research on cancer and they come to me and say, Agnes, we'll pay you $5 a month for the data you will give us for the next six months. Imagine if you go to very, you know, third world countries that live for less than dollar, you know, a day or a month, whatever it is. That's a huge improvement in their economic status. And, you know, their day, you know, their human data or their data on, on, on them, health data is very similar to mine, you know, and should be using those studies because those drugs should be developed for everybody equally. So uh, I think those, yeah, those two points uh, on my end. Great. Um, Mihal, I'm sure you have uh, something to add to our manifesto here. Uh, for me, is uh, the self-sovereign identity. And uh, when I, the identity, exactly what Agnes uh, mentioned in the beginning, when the identity be belongs to me from birth, with my DNA and everything, and then from there into economic identity with my wallet, and then I can play in the world from that place of empowerment, then is when we will succeed. <laughs> Very good. Uh, Lou, what would you add to our manifesto, a principle that you think all leaders should be adopting? I think uh, probably the application to the basic in our world, diversity. Mm. I think we're living the world, sorry for taking my stand here, we're living a world built by and for men. And we have half of the population, they're women, and we really need technology to address the problem. And really the, 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 the creator of the technology have the mindset for this technology to serve women and other uh, minority or immigrant, immigrant backgrounds. So diverse the background users. So I would say diversity is really, really critical. And another thing, you know, another, another word like diversity is critical for innovation. 
Well, on this this dimension, yeah, if awesome. another, this panel is is off to a good start, I think, um, with uh, with with sixty percent uh, women on it. So, um, <laughs> we're, we're drawing to a close now. I I, I want to uh, thank our, our, our panelists, Lu Zhang, Agnes Budson, Miala Ulieru, and and Kurt Bresnica, uh, for a very spirited discussion on a very important topic. And uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for leading the panel. We really appreciate Thank that. You Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a good night, guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.